this is kind of like a, a, a continuation of our our metabolism chapter, but it's in respect to what we just went over, which is the gastrointestinal system. So we already know that our body needs nutrients. We need it to build and to make things. And of course, you need stuff in large nutrients. So macro means what? Large. Big, large. So carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, those are our main three. And micronutrients, of course, vitamins, minerals, so, and uh, um, they, they, they're they kind of like helpers. So you don't need that much. Uh, need uh, need that much. Uh, so that's also what I was stating about vitamins. Your body throws out anything it doesn't need. So that's why if you just take vitamins in pill form, it's going to throw out more than 90% of it. Um, so micronutrients are, are only required in small amounts. Now, of course, there are some things that are essential that the body cannot synthesize in itself and that's why we eat. We eat food because, uh, I, I go, and especially in the form of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, because I, because I need that to live. Now, um, calories. We have, the way we measure intake and the way we measure outtake is through this thing called calories. It's a unit of heat. It's also a unit of energy. <clears throat> so, Diets are simply this. You measure how much intake, right? How much your patient is taking in. And then you also, of course, how much your patient burns. And of course, in calories. So let's say, for example, if you does, if you eat like 10,000 calories a day, you better do what every day? Like work out a lot. So a typical Olympic athlete works out anywhere from six to eight hours a day. Professional athletes work, what, six to eight hours plus a day. So it's not weird for them to eat 10,000 calories a day. But a typical sedentary lifestyle is what? Sitting around just like us, you know, doesn't move around. I'm not lifting heavy stones or anything like that. So uh, that individual, that patient is going to require far less. Now, one of the macronutrients, of course, we already know is uh, carbohydrates. They're composed of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. And one of the carbohydrate sources is, of course, um, um, sugars. And they either come in complicated sugars, and we know they're complicated because it says poly, many, or they can have simple sugars such as disaccharides and monosaccharides. And the, um, the, the thing that we're always trying to do is of course, we're going to take all the complex carbohydrates that we can, but what do we ultimately want only? At the end of the day, the body only takes the okay. currency, which is glucose. And we already know that from previous chapters, because glucose plus oxygen equals um, uh, ATP. So, of course, glucose is our cellular fuel. It's what we store. And we already know about CO2 and water, because... We take in glucose and oxygen, and what do we get as a byproduct? It's a dehydration synthesis. So we get water and CO2. So that's the thing that I kick out. Um, look at the term lipogenesis. That means genesis to create what? Lipids. So if I don't readily need that energy, I don't readily need that glucose, I can store it in the form of glycogen. And, or I could store it in the form of fat. And gluconeogenesis, that's gluco, glucose, neo means new. So I could actually make new glucose uh, by taking uh, carbohydrates and then doing what? Breaking them down and then create sugar. So my body can either take sugar, break it down and store it, or it can take anything in its body that it broke down and then create what? New sugar. So the term gluconeogenesis makes new sugar. Lipogenesis makes fat. Now, we already know what sugars are. You don't need to memorize this because we're not in a biochemistry class. But if you see O-S-E, -S you know it's a what? A sugar. 
So what's fructose? Fructose is the sugar that you get from fruits. And glucose, that's the glucose that we all know and love. And what's galactose? If you're lactose intolerant, right? Dairy. That's uh, like the stuff that you, it's, uh, it's part of the milk sugars. So you could see that all arrows are pointing towards what? Glucose. Because ultimately, what's the only thing our brains eat? Glucose. Ultimately, ultimately, what's the only thing that the mitochondria eats? Glucose. Do we have to know the, the different parts of the sources of carbohydrates? Uh, the, the, I know that there are two of them are the simple sugars and then the polys. The... Yeah, just know that polysaccharide is what? Complex. Complex. Poly, many. Okay. Disaccharide means what? How many sugars? Two. 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 Right and monosaccharide is a, is a very simple sugar. That's what kind of sugar? One. And what's the one sugar that we love? Glucose. Glucose. So if you see this chart right here, you can see all we're ever doing with all this stuff like carbohydrates, uh, sucrose, maltose, lactose. At the end of the day, what do I want? It goes it goes. What do I always want? Do you see the the common denominator here? Glucose. 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 That's what we what we always want. And we already know what respiration is, is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And of course, water, because ultimately, what do we want at the end of the day? ATP. And that's what this energy thing is in respiration. And glycogenesis, let's say I have a whole bunch of glucose, but I don't need it right now. I can store it in the form of glycogen. And of course, lipogenesis, if I have extra sugar, what am I going to store it as? I'm going to store it as fat. So there's two storage forms of fat. Well, not really. One storage form of fat, which is, of course, lipids, right? That's lipogenesis. But what is glycogenesis storing? It's storing sugar. So it goes back to uh, what I was telling before. If, because if we're eating for pure fuel versus eating for fun and eating for sadness or eating for, you know, just because it's Tuesday, right and you're bored your body goes will store anything that's excess and now you could see like obesity and excess fat is just what you're taking in too much too much of everything and what's your body converting it to glucose and then i'm storing it in the form of glycogen and of course fats i'm storing in the form of uh new lipids and that term is called lipogenesis now Carbohydrate uh, requirements. Don't have to memorize this unless you want to be a dietitian. Lipids. We already know an example of lipids is tri uh, triglycerides. And uh, the, um, the uh, transportation form of lipids is called cholesterol. And we already know that when we discussed the other day, HDL versus LDL versus VLDL. Now, Notice that I said we needed all three, all three macronutrients. So any diet that has to kill any one of them, like for example, Atkins one diet was made what in the 90s or whatever. They said what? Get rid of what? All carbohydrates. So everything's just proteins and some fats. You can now see from this, this basic representation of the uh, of this PowerPoint, you see how wrong that is. Because what does the human body need? It needs all three. So any diet that we'll be giving to our patient will have what? Carbohydrates, we'll have fats, and we'll have proteins. There's not like, you see some of these crazy diets out there like caveman diet, like, like I'm only gonna eat raw meat or whatever. But you could see some of these fat diets, it's actually missing percentages of things, uh, uh, of things that are required by our body. Now, what are some lipid sources? We already know what cholesterol is. Cholesterol in abundance in uh, a lot of different foods, more cholesterol equals more what? Fat. Fat, because we now know what does what is cholesterol's function. Cholesterol's function is to transport the majority of the VLDL and LDL, it transports fat where? Into your body, not out of your body. So if you eat lots of foods that are high in cholesterol, what are you telling your body that you sh it should do? You're telling your body it should do what? Start putting fats where? In, right? Now, saturated versus unsaturated fats. Now, the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats is that 
saturated fats, that's the stuff that isn't good for you, like coconut oil. You guys know why you got uh, in the past, well, maybe not now, why um, popcorn tasted so good only in the movie theater and not at your house? <laughs> I used to work for Cineplex Odeon when I was in high school. Do you know back in the 80s what we used to uh, cook the popcorn with? Coconut oil. Coconut oil is solid at room temperature. Most saturated fats are solid at room temperature. So room temperature is, and even on a warm day, right, it goes, is just only just a little bit under our temperature. So what do you think it's gonna, saturated fats are gonna do inside your arteries? Don't you think they have a more propensity since they're solid at room temperature to clog up? And uh, um, uh, it says they don't have a lot of double bonds, which means uh, that, remember when we talked about bonds before, especially like hydrogen <laughs> bonds, and it made things what? More flexible. So if this thing doesn't have any double bonds, that means what? This thing isn't so flexible. And that's hence, that's why it's solid at room temperature. But if you look at unsaturated fats, right? They have a lot of double bonds and it's healthier uh, cooking with the plant oils like safflower oil. Now your fries won't taste as good, right? Because of, remember lipostat, we talked about that before, your fat tooth. You know how people have a glucostat, a sugar tooth? Well, we all have a fat tooth. Right, so that's um, unsaturated fats. Think what? Plant oils, nut oils, the healthier oils, they're lighter. But saturated fats, think what? The heavier uh, palm and coconut oils, which are of course solid at room temperature. Now, what's the function of lipids? We already know the function. It's a storage form, and it's also, it does a whole bunch of things for us. In the nervous system, we already know it makes myelin right? We need that. I need it for insulation. And also I need it when it's cold. I also need it if I fall on my butt. I need what? Some padding, right? But because uh, again, in excess, how much trouble am I in? I could be some trouble. Question? Yeah, so which one, that's the, uh, the and which one is butter? Well, because if you look at this, there's some butters that you can make with what? Because, uh, but most butters, the better ones, are made with what? Animal fat. So a lot of the butters, the really good ones, right, will be saturated fat. But there, of course, there's butters, there's margarines, there's also like, you know, can't believe it's not butter. And those were made by what? Unsaturated fat. What about like people substituting butters for oil? Same concept? Yeah, it's the same thing because What's butter? Isn't it solid at room temperature? Mm -hmm. Like, especially the really good ones, right? Um, any of you all make your own? Like, especially for good dishes and stuff, right? That stuff butter. is what? It's pretty much lard. But it tastes absolutely fabulous. But what do we now know about atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic plaques, right? The, pla the fat, if you have excessive amounts of fat in your bloodstream, what's it gonna do to your clotting, it's gonna make it worse. What's it gonna do to the viscosity of your blood? It's gonna make it thicker. If your blood's thicker, what's it gonna make your heart and your arteries do? Work, Work harder. harder. So that's why um, dietitians are always promoting uh, um, uh, safflower oil and um, uh, the, what do you call it? The unsaturated fats, I'm, I'm circling the wrong thing. The unsaturated fats here. Now we already know the functions of lipids and the good things, it's storage and, and um, we can use it as energy. But again, too much of a good thing turns in, of course, a bad thing. We already talked about VLDLs, LDLs, and HDLs. Um, uh, cholesterol means what? I have a lot of H VLDL and HDL, LDL are cholesterol proteins that will do what? Transport fat where? Inside. So of course it's going to have a high triglyceride content. It's going to it's going to be what? It's going to uh, uh, I don't know increase increase all your fats. But HDLs, that's what high protein content. But there's not that many HDLs. What's the function of HDL? HDL takes fat 
out of the system. And that's why when you uh, eat like, you know, uh, your oatmeals and whole grains, right? And a lot of stuff that has, um, uh, you know, um, insoluble cellulose, uh, um, insoluble tissue stuff, um, like um, plant tissue starches, that'll do what? Just like we talked about the corn. When you eat corn, what ends up in the toilet? Corn. But what we don't see, all the fats. So that's a way to kind of increase your HDLs. And of course, who do we know controls fats and metabolizes fats? Liver, of course. Uh, now, proteins. We already know what proteins are, and we know that they do a whole bunch of things. They're enzymes, hormones, antibodies, clotting factors, and we already know our three magic, uh, why did I say magic? Well, our three very important plasma proteins, which are albumin, fibrinogen, and immunoglobulins. But what do they all have in common? They all have amino groups. They all have nitrogen. Hence, the short term, uh, uh, the, the short slang for protein is CHON, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And you could see they're very important because if I don't have a chain of amino acids connected by peptide bonds, I don't have any of these things, enzymes, hormones, antibodies, clotting factors, and the like. Protein sources. Now, should I talk about that? Nope. Eh, unless you're a dietitian, this slide's not good for you either. So let's talk about energy expenditure. Now, like I stated, your intake can be greater, your caloric intake can be greater if, of course, you lead a more active lifestyle. So um, there's, of course, a balance and a give and a take. And of course, the calorie is, um, it's uh, a measure of heat and it's a measure of, um, of uh, also uh, intake. Like how much fuel did you, uh, uh, did you get? Now, your BMR is your basal or basal octato, metabolic rate. How much energy do you expend under normal conditions? And of course, if you're an Olympic athlete, if you're a um, male, will have a, a larger BMR because why? Who has more muscle to burn? Male. Male, right? Body size. Um, there's different kinds of uh, sizes of people. Uh, you guys seen um, uh, uh, people who are like more stocky, they're, they're called endomorphs. You also seen people who are more um, like they're taller and they're always skinny, right? And those people are ectomorphs. And then everybody in the middle, mesomorph. And those different types of body types burn energy at different rates. So it depends on gender, body size, genetics. But um, that's the reason why I have to eat because I have to maintain a basal metabolic rate. Oh, by the way, who controls our metabolism? What hormone? I mean, not, not hormone, well, you could say hormone, but what, um, thyroid. what gland? Thyroid. So if my thyroid is overactive, what happens to my metabolism? Speed Increase or in decrease? Increase. Increase. So if I had hyperthyroidism, will my patient gain weight or lose weight? Lose, lose weight. Will my patient have increased heart rate or decreased heart rate? Increase. Will they have increased blood pressure? Decreased blood pressure. Increase. Increased respiratory rate. Decreased respiratory rate. Increase. So now you know if someone has, uh, got, if uh, thyroid gets messed up, increases the uh, basal basal metabolic rate. Don't you think all the things that I just mentioned, heart rate, blood pressure, and uh, weight loss will be what? Increased. Now let's talk about hypothyroidism. The exact opposite. What will happen to my patient? Do you think blood pressure will go down? Yeah. Yes. How about, are they gonna be fast or slow? Slow. Slow, they're gonna be tired, not moving around all day. Will they have weight gain or weight loss? Gain. Weight gain. So now you could see how the basal metabolic rate can, can, can go either way, but we wanna maintain it where? Somewhere in the middle. Now, what do we always want? And this is the key to lifestyle changes and the key to the, the diet and workout balance. It's called a positive, and it goes, um, it goes positive energy balance 
versus negative energy balance. Now, positive energy balance, of course, your caloric intake exceeds its output. So if you're taking way too many calories, what's your body going to want to do? It's going to want to store it because your body doesn't know when's the next time you're going to eat, so it's going to think what? Store, store, store. Now, positive energy balance, it's the reason why 40% of this country is obese because we have a sedentary lifestyle. Think about everything that we do all day. You don't, we don't walk too much. You don't do too much. Um, how far is my stairs away from my car? How far is my, and of course, I'm just like every one of you. When I look for a parking space, what, what parking space am I going to look like? I actually want to go limp around so I can get the blue parking space right in the front, right? But of course, don't do that. I'm recording. Don't do that, right? But what do we do? What do we do in this American lifestyle? Everything is about what? Expediency and comfort and leisure. But it goes, uh, so we're going to want to do what? Store and weight gain. But if we're trying to lose weight, we're going to try to go for that negative energy balance where caloric expenditure exceeds the intake. So that will lead to weight loss. And there's something called physiologic weight loss. So if we're doing things the right way, you should lose barely, actually even less than a pound per week. And when you're in a weight loss program, do you lose weight every week? No. Weight loss is like what? There's, you got your ups and downs. And that's what also kills a lot of programs because when, when the person sees the weight loss, right? Let's say you were, lost four pounds the first week. You get all hype. And then the next week you gain two, which is normal. The thing is, that's why we call it lifestyle changes and not diets anymore. Because diet connotes what? Bad. But lifestyle changes, I'm going to be on this track of negative energy balance for what? The rest of my life. So that what's it going to take to lose the rest of the weight to get to your supposedly goal weight? Think about what? The rest of your life. And if you... and Actually, over the years, the best thing that I, because I can honestly, we can, I can recommend uh, to your future patients and maybe yourself if you're, you're going to uh, be your own patient, is to do what? Don't look at that um, scale. Don't look at the calipers, you know, the little things well, that like they the do DM at the gym. Anymore. It will demotivate you. What should you look at? And um, it goes, um, a lot of the stuff, especially in internal medicine and dietetics, we ask, we usually... Um, like when the patient goes, oh, how much weight did I lost? Let's not talk about that. We'll always talk about how do you feel? How's your abilities? Hey, goes, do you remember when you couldn't walk 20 minutes on the treadmill? How many minutes are you up to now? Well, I'm on 35, Dr. Black, and now I have an incline. I goes, um, I'm now on like 2%, and I'm going to go for 3% next week. That's the kind of numbers you should see, so it'll then motivate your patient to do what? Go forward. But even if you explain to your patient that there's going to be dips and troughs, you know, there's going to be highs and lows, because you don't lose weight like this in a straight line. You lose weight like what? And then when you get sick, what happens? You can gain some weight. And then when you really, do you guys know that sometimes your body's really on it and maybe you lose two pounds in one week, right? But then what are you going to try to do? You're going to try to even keel it and do not lose more than a pound. So if you lose like, 0 0.8, an average of 0 0.8, 0 0.7 pounds per week, then you're doing what? Fabulous. But if a couple of weeks you don't lose any weight, that's okay. Is your patient still on the plan for negative energy balance? That means are they eating lesser than they used to? Good. Are they doing more work physically than they used to? So how about some other things? Like um, um, my office used to be on the ninth floor. So my challenge to my staff was when I used to be at that office, uh, none of y'all take the elevator, right? Or take the elevator like at the fourth floor or whatever, right? So what did we all do? And then in my last school I was with, we actually had a 3 p.m. break during the day. You guys know in the office, what happens around 3 p.m.? Everyone starts getting the snackies, right? And trying to, you know, trying to stretch the day until six o'clock. But uh, my dean... Uh, we had a um, a contest of steps. We called it steps. So everyone was issued like this cheap, I know, a pedometer. And then what'd we do? Everyone in the whole building took a couple of minutes off and did what? Walk around. 
students, everybody, and then it became like a contest. And then so what happened? The people who stayed true to it, they gamified it. What happened to the, 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 their health? Now, the, uh, we also did it as a little study. Average weight loss for the people who did 10,000 10, steps per day, which is, what is it roughly, a little over two miles? What's, what's 10,000 steps, a little over two miles a day? Two or three. Right? So if you're walking and you don't have to run, just walk. And think about it. If you just walk, how much is that already burning? Isn't that more than what? What you typically would do? So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get our patient to buy in and not only buy in, to maintain a negative energy balance because that is, that is what our goal is. Now, the desirable weight, like how do we know if it's bad or not? Well, one of the old school ways of doing it, now it's multifactorial. When you go to the dietitian, they do the calipers, you know, those little pinchy things where they pinch your arm and then they pinch your side and they pinch here, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a, a chart that they look at to see if you're overweight. Well, one of the easiest things we do is your body mass index, which is essentially your weight, uh, your weight in kilograms, I forgot, weight in kilograms divided by your height or height divided by weight, I forgot. But all I know is that BMI is your body mass index. It's not a way that, like, even though it says overweight and obese, the BMI is not too accurate, it's exaggerating. Because when I show you the BMI right now, you'll see that what? range for like height and age. And yeah, and you'll see that it doesn't take into account, remember I told you some people are ectomorphs. They're really tall, right? And they don't gain a lot of weight. Uh, my sons are like that. They're tall and they're skinny. They eat like no one's business and they don't gain a pound. Actually, they're underweight. So then the BMI will do what? We'll say they're in the green or, the, or in the blue. When actuality, it's, it's just, BMI is just a, a way of telling us, did we improve or did we not improve? So if, if you look at yourself here and then you're in the red, it doesn't mean you're what? You're gonna die, you're grossly obese, maybe you should be on that show. No, it just means that's the number. And then we're gonna do what? Track that number. And if you're in the green, it means what? You're overweight. You're not at the uh, uh, your optimal range. Now, how did they figure this out? Here's the other issue. All of us are from all different walks of life and all different places. The way they figured out BMI is they took the average of like all the people in the world. Now, that's the problem. It's an average. Some of us are tall. Some of us are shorter. So some of us are from this part of the world. Some of us are that part of the world. So when we're looking at the BMI, we're only looking at it as what? As a way to gauge where you are, okay? It's not a way to label like, oh, you're obese. Oh, you're overweight. Oh, you're good. Because the person in the blue could have a really bad cholesterol, right? The person in the blue could be wonderful. They have a great BMI, but then their cholesterol is in the toilet. So is that person healthy? Mm -hmm. No, it's just that for their height, for weight, they're in a good... They're in a good zone. It's the same thing. Have any of you guys uh, who have children have seen that pink form or that blue form, the one with the wave that tells your kid is P50, P10, P25, or whatever? That P means percentile. So if your kid's in the 50 percentile, it doesn't mean your kid's average. It just means what? On the scale of all the Americans, your kid is where? Smack dab in the middle. Now, in pediatrics, I don't care if your kid's P50, P25, or P90, right? I care what? If your kid's P90, is there a trend going down to what? P85. And if your kid is P10, is there a trend going up to what? P20 to get my kid closer to what? P50. That's the same thing what this is. You're gonna, the, the nutritionist uh, and your physician uh, is going to use this as what? As a gauge to see where we're going. Are we going up or we're going down? And that's your body mass index, and it's based on your height and weight. Question. So what does the, the numbers in the inside of the box mean? The numbers just mean what? It's just the number that you calculated. Remember I told you BMI is like, I forgot, is it height in centimeters divided by your weight in kilograms squared? Some formula. I forgot it already. Last time I saw it, I was in medical school. That's what those numbers in the middle mean. But let's say, let's look at me. 
I'm five foot nothing, so that's what, five four ish. And I'm being very nice to myself, maybe adding an inch. So I'm five four and what am I, 205? So I'm where? Five four, and I scroll over here, and under between the 200 and 210, my BMI, BMI is 34. A good BMI is what? Under 30. A better BMI is what? 25. So what? What is my what is my doctor doing? My doctor is seeing what? Oh, he's at 32. What are we now going to do to get him to 31? What are we then going to do once I'm at 31? Get him to 30. That's what we use it for. I mean, but yes, I'm technically if I look at my BMI, I'm obese class one. Now, class there's three classifications. The ones you see on TV, that's class three, and that's what they call morbidly obese. And more abound patients are what? They have multi-systemic problems and they're in a lot of trouble. Those patients you see, what's the name of that show? My 600 pound life yeah. or something like that. Those patients you see are in a lot of trouble. That's why they have the bariatric specialist and that's why they're pushing what? Massive amounts of weight loss greater than one pound per week. And they're also promoting what? Surgery. Because that person is already in an extreme case. But for the rest of us who are, you know, kind of in the red here, what do we now have to do? I now have to look at the two things, right? One, my caloric intake, and what? My caloric expenditure. And my caloric intake has to be less than my expenditure. And if it's less, my intake is less than what I expend, then that's what? Negative, and negative caloric uh, intake, and that's what I want. And that's how I'm gonna lose weight. Or that's how your patient's gonna lose weight. Now, appetite. Ah. This is my nemesis because honestly, even now after it's been a little bit over a year, even after he goes, even after now, right? I get hungry. And again, I goes, uh, appetite is not only uh, physical, it's uh, also mental. So the control center is the hypothalamus. That's important. Right, because we also know the hypothalamus deals with homeostasis and me eating food deals with me what? Being in the middle, right? So what are some important ones? We already know what insulin does, so we're gonna skip insulin. Let's look at leptin. Leptin is uh, secreted by fat cells. Now, that means if I got a lot of fat, leptin should get released. And what should leptin do? It should suppress my appetite. But remember what I told you guys about being in buffet, right? How many times you were on the sixth plate of buffet, right? Your stomach's already distended. You're already, you're already wearing your fat pants and it's really tight. But you look at the, the, um, uh, the what do you call it? You look at the dessert tray and go, yeah, I can handle it. Why is your body not telling you stop? Why is leptin not telling you stop? Because leptin is a hormone. Are hormones fast or slow? Slow. Slow. So that's why I mentioned during my first couple of lectures that when I eat, what do I do? I eat half of whatever's in front of me. Only half. And then I wait what? 20 minutes because leptin has to catch up. So if I had my, uh, the other day, I, uh, I had um, something that was very fat laden because I wanted to. Right, but I did portion control. I did what? Ate half, then I answered some emails. Then uh, it goes, I played my word puzzle game. Next thing I noticed, what's there still on my page? Half. Now I'm looking at it. Do I want it anymore? No. Another strategy for those of you who have got kids, especially those of you who have ectomorphic skinny boys who can eat all day. So what do I do when I go to McDonald's? Who do I always bring? I bring bean pole number one, Nelson Harmy, and then the mini bean pole, uh, Edison. They both come with me, and then what do I order? I order whatever I want, but then what happens? The Coke gets split up, right? Well, the little one hates Coke, right? So the big one gets what? More than half my large drink. So that's not done, right? And how about my uh, uh, my quarter pound with cheese, right? What happened, right? Baby ate about a third of it. He ate around a half of it, and what do I got left? A couple of bites. Baby's gonna eat more than half of those fries. Who's gonna eat the rest of the fries? but did I have enough to taste? And how's my caloric balance? Good. So I now got to eat what I wanted to eat, 
And then you wait a couple of minutes, I'm still going to be hungry. Now I'm driving home, and when the two bean poles tell me, mm, so hungry, we should have bought three burgers. No, shut up. This is, this is the food you get. We're, all, we're moving on with our day, right? Then what happened? My appetite is gone because now the fat was enough to tell, tell my hypothalamus, release leptin. It's just fat in the system. You don't need any more. We have more than what we have. So is it any surprise with tactics like this, waiting 20 minutes, letting, uh, letting the ectomorphs of the world eat all my food and probably giving my son's heart disease, right? Goes, hasn't been working for me. Yeah, I'm no longer 240. But how long did it took me? It took me a year. And am I still out of the 200 zone? No. Not a year, how many weeks is that? That's what, 52 weeks and I still haven't lost 30 pounds? But for the last year, didn't I keep it off, mm -hmm. right? So that's my goal. And this goal is now for the rest of my life. This is not only for this year or maybe you know, until the next pandemic comes. It's for what? The rest of my life. I'll answer you after we get to the other two. Neuropeptide Y. Again, hypothalamus. It's in response to <coughs> ghrelin. Now, what does ghrelin do for me? Ghrelin, right, looks like gastric, right? Secreted by my stomach. It enhances uh, uh, neuropeptide Y. So leptin, right, is what? Suppresses appetite. Neuropeptide Y and ghrelin do what? Increase appetite, right? So I can ask you an exam. Between neuropeptide Y and ghrelin, which one increases appetite? Neuropeptide Y, ghrelin, both, neither. It'll be, of course, what? Both. Now, who suppresses appetite? Leptin. Where is, because where is neuropeptide and leptin from? From the hypothalamus. Where is ghrelin from, which sounds like ghrelin, gastric, stomach. So it's from my stomach. Could you go home tonight, make that chart, just like we did when we made charts for chapter 14, 15, and 16? So I can get this straight instead of, because if you look at it like this, doesn't it belong to different categories? But at home, can you make your little chart? Yep, and that's how it controls appetite. And all of this, doesn't it take a while? It all takes a while because it's what? It's hormones. Hormones have to get released into your blood all the way from your hypothalamus and all the way from your stomach and then mix in your blood and then do what? Hit the target tissue and then you feel what you feel, right? So was knowing that, what's the best thing to do? And also, same thing. How many of you have a very busy life? Almost everybody, if not everybody in the room. So how do you, most, most of you guys eat? Most of you guys eat very fast, right? Now, if you eat fast, are you giving leptin a time to tell you mm -mm. it's time to stop? No, but you're eating way too fast, right? So I could, I could down a gallon of uh, oil and my leptin won't tell me anything because why? Glug, 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 done, right? Question. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, leptin, you say it tells you to eat or release? No, leptin uh -huh. suppresses appetite. Leptin tells you what? You're not hungry. What? Who tells you you're hungry? Neuropeptide Y and ghrelin. Neuropeptide Y is from your hypothalamus. Ghrelin is from your stomach. And those two things tell you what? Yeah. You are hungry. <laughs> Next, vitamins. We know that vitamins are what? They're complement. You know, they're, they're, they're add-ons to our enzymes. Our enzyme does all the work, right? Breaks down stuff, decreases our activation energy so we can uh, uh, run processes quicker. But vitamins, they're important and they're essential, cannot be synthesized uh, by my body. So they have to be taken in by, uh, by food. Notice that this thing didn't say pills. So you want to get more vitamin A in your life? What do you do? Eat a carrot, right? Or don't uh, super cook your carrots. Um, also, uh, another thing that um, uh, Dr. Zhang used to tell me, you know, there's a lot of nutrients on the skins of all of uh, your vegetables. Just scrub it, get all the garbage and schmutz out of it, but then do what? Eat it. Eat it. Because remember, we all know that what's always the tough 
outer fibrous covering of things. Who has the most cellulose content in your carrot, in your celery, or whatnot? It's all the skin. Same thing with your potatoes. Also, it's the way you cook your potatoes. If I slice up my potatoes and then deep fry them, right? Of course, it's gonna be horrible. Or if I bake my potato, but sour cream and bacon bits the way I love it, I also put a sprinkle of Doritos just for a bit, <laughs> right? It's all the same color and it's all gonna end up the same color in the toilet anyway, right? So what am I doing? I'm getting the negative effects from those potatoes. But what if I made poached russet potatoes? I chop them up, all right? And I do what? Blanch them real fast. You get still that crispiness and then you get what? The starch that you need. And do I have to eat 20 of them? No, I just eat what? Just enough, wait my 20 minutes, let leptin kick in. Now, when I eat my things with vitamins in it, there are called the fat soluble vitamins. And the way you're gonna remember that they're fat soluble is ADEK, A-D-E-K. And the water soluble is what? And everything else. So if I could ask you, vitamin A, fat soluble or water soluble? Hey, that's ADEC. So that's gotta be fat soluble. Vitamin K, fat soluble or water soluble? Hey, that's ADEC and that's fat soluble. That's the worst I'll do to you. Can you tell the difference between fat and uh, water soluble? And, uh, and fat is ADEC. Uh, now, since vitamins and minerals, are they macro or micronutrients? Micro. They're micro. So do I need a lot of it? No. So is it very easy to overdose on it? Sure, yeah, right? So what's gonna happen if I have too much of something in my body? My body is gonna treat it like it's what? Urine or feces. So what's it gonna do? It's either gonna pee it out or it's gonna poop it out or defecate it out. And that's exactly what happens when you give a multivitamin with no proper complementary diet. It's going, you're gonna find it, and especially central, leaves a lovely, lovely yellow-orange color to your urine. And then it's just all there, and, it's, and, it, and it gives it that very, very geriatric smell. You guys know that smell, mm -hmm. right? That's in um, those of you who are CNAs, right? You know that smell, that urea, very medicine-y smell that is in many um, uh, assisted living facilities. And it's because of what? I can tell you right now, everybody in that facility has a ton of what? Vitamins, uh, way too many meds. Polypharmacy is very, very common above the age of 65. Not for me though, I try to lessen uh, my patient's drugs as much as possible. Now, minerals, of course, those are the things that are inside the ground. And again, micronutrients, you don't need too many of them. Uh, and what were the, some of the minerals of, um, of uh, importance that we saw before? We saw calcium, right? Is that turns, the, that turns our car on or off, calcium? On. On. We also saw phosphorus. Where did we see phosphorus? Oh, how we forget so easily. How about ATP? Yeah. Right? How about electron transport chain and electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation? We need ATP, so we need phosphorus. That's in minerals. We also talked about ions, sodium and chloride. Sodium, does that turn things on or off? On. on. Right? So if my salt and remember pH balance, pH is made out of what? Hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. I need a balance of what? Both. Because what's the pH of my patient? Neutral. One, seven, or 14? Seven. Seven, or seven-ish. 7.4 to be exact. So again, just like vitamins, if I ate a whole bunch of minerals and a whole bunch of electrolytes, just like we were talking about, what were, did, uh, did I tell you guys about Gatorade and how Gatorade got really upset at the College of um, Sports Medicine? Because College of Sports Medicine said, you know what's better than Gatorade? Water. Water. Even if you're like an extreme athlete, just get water because your body will do what? Will perform homeostasis. So you don't need all those extra little salts or whatever. Is it um, like um, a concept of 
it's dangerous to drink alcoholic beverages and Gatorade at the same time? No, because what's dangerous in alcoholic beverages, and I think I mentioned it in this class already, is Red Bull and alcohol. Okay. Because remember, Red Bull is a what? Increasing Stimulant. heart rate. Alcohol is what? A depressant. Remember we talked about that situation with Viagra and um, mm -hmm. and uh, antihypertensive medication? Yeah. What are you doing? Reversing. You're making your body fight itself. And if it fights itself, what's it going to want to do? For less than 10% of the population, uh, it turns it off. So you don't want to be that person. And I don't know. Uh, Red Bull tastes like battery acid. I don't I don't see how, like, yeah, I guess I just, uh, you know, if you just, I just go straight for tequila or straight for, I don't know, um, what's horrific to drink? Pure green alcohol, right? Uh, Everclear. <laughs> you know why they call it Everclear? It's going to turn all your insides what? Clear, <laughs> right? That stuff's horrendous. Um, I can't eat sherbet ice cream because um, I had a little uh, bit of a, an adventure. We made a uh, we made a Punch. volcano out of sher orange sherbet ice cream when I was in my fraternity. And what spouted out of the top? Everclear. Everclear. Well, who ate it all? You. Me. What happened to me after? Poisoning. Poison. As an ER, went to, had to get my stomach pumped. And to this day, every time I smell orange sherbet, what do I start doing? No, no, no. Right? Even mango because it has that same color. And it had the same fruity smell. Mm -hmm. Even I'm getting agit just thinking about it. Now, if you look at this, trace elements, micro minerals, again, do I need tons of it? So should you be going to GNC and like, hmm, let me get a whole bunch of mm -hmm. copper sulfate pills. Maybe I might turn my eyeballs green. No, you don't need, or this. This is another one, chromium and selenium. All these people who are like, think that, oh, you know, I got some joint pain. I'm going to take chromium and selenium. Do you know how much chromium and selenium you have to take to even change your uh, chromium and selenium intake? Um, I figured it out once when I was in uh, teaching pharmacology. You need like something like 400 pills. Same thing with potassium. Potassium is what? You don't need a lot of it in your body. Do you know how much you need to take to increase your potassium? 1%? One bushel. Yeah, any of uh, any y'all been to a uh, place that got bananas? What does a bushel of bananas look like? It's that whole banana tree, like this oh, that's big. that's a bushel? This amount of bananas, like this. Like you can't even carry it, right? But so what's better? Just eat the right things. Water, balance, instead of what? Selenium, jeez. Now, health eating, of course, and the requirements, and that's why we all requirements vary from person to person. Um, all of us have different pathologies. All of us have different uh, body types and metabolism. So that's why before you start on any regimen, you really should consult your, your primary care physician because then they can do what? Gauge, they can, um, they can tell you your BMI and then have a realistic plan. In every doctor's office and, and also in every ward, we now have what? Every diet for every person. And we have low and no salt diets that are what? They're called progressive diet. These are really cool. Like, let's say you really need a no salt diet. Do I take away all your salt today? No, but in the next six weeks, I do it what? Here's your diet meal pan. Follow it. It's like those Gene Simmons, you know, diet meal cards. In this meal card, you're allowed this many grams of salt. In this meal card, and then you follow it. Guess what happens at the end of like six to eight weeks? You're already at that low salt level. And am I happy as your doctor? Yeah, because I didn't did what ease you into it. That's the same thing. Lo, um, uh, was it this? The well, why do I think it's this class? You're in my only class. I had a class before where I had a student who had gallbladder removed. She had her gallbladder removed, so she had a colito cholecystectomy. Say that eight times fast. So what can she no longer eat? Salt. Nope. What does the what does uh, bile do for us? If they took out her gallbladder, because it breaks down fat, so she has a what? An almost a low to no fat diet. So could she eat anything from anywhere? No. No. Everything has to be pre-prepared, and it has to be what? So low, and and she's like, "Stop, guys! I can't taste any of these things." And I'm like, "Oh, it has to be you. At least you're alive, right? At least you don't have cancer." But that's the. And she was only 23, 24. Man. 
that's, I mean, it hurts me now in my 50s. How much more if someone told me 23, nope, can't have any more Doritos. What say you? I would rather die. Now, there are recommended daily allowances, RDA, right? And the RDA is, of course, regulated by the FDA. But again, they're talking about a generalized person. That's why it's best to see, uh, you know, when you really are serious about doing a diet, really serious about doing a, um, an exercise regimen. And also, try not to listen to that chucklehead in the gym who probably had a six week, uh, uh, some six week weekend class on, uh, on like working out. Get a dietitian, get a physician who knows a little bit about, uh, about uh, exercise physiology because that's one of the courses we take in medical school, because when I, because guess who writes the order for your physical therapist and occupational therapist? Me, right? The MD does. So we gotta know about like, what kind of activities are good for people who can't run. And my thing is, especially for, if your joints can't handle it, and my doctor keeps on telling me the same thing, hit the pool, yeah, swim. right? Get the swimming, but I'm like, I can tell you, Running is just so, uh, and also, when I swim, I don't know, I get bored. When I run, my mind, my mind tends to, I don't know, expand. Now, there's different type of vegetarian diets. You don't need to know this because, in my professional opinion, once you start to get closer and closer to vegan and serious vegan diets, they start taking away stuff. And um, I'm not a thing about, I'm, I'm not a person about taking away stuff because, Remember, what must you have? You have to have what? Your carbohydrates, proteins, and, and a lot of the, uh, of course, the vegans, right? It's very, very hard to replace meat protein with a whole bunch of beans, mm -hmm. right? Because, but you can. And I know several vegans who have done it, but it's a very, very stringent lifestyle, right? And, uh, but there's dividends to it. And there's pluses and, and uh, minuses to it. Me, I think what finding something in the middle, uh, something closer to like pesco vegetarian and semi vegetarians, right? Um, you know, there's a nice little background. And fish, especially poached fish, is fabulous not only for protein. Fish has omega three fatty acids. It's probably the only acids that will do what? Um, the only fatty acid that will upgrade your HDL, right? And kick out a whole bunch of fat that you don't need. Why do you think um, uh, the Japanese people and a lot of people in the Southeast Asian basin are not only not obese, but they live forever and a day because they don't fry their fish the way we do. When we, we as Americans, what do we do with our fish? I gotta put it in what? I gotta dredge it in some sort of batter and then I gotta deep fry it because that's how it is. And it's gotta have fries with it, right? But if, uh, if you've ever looked at a Southeast Asian meal, it's usually what? Poached, meaning it's, they barely boil, they boil it or they, they steam it. And then do, do you think they eat like a lot of fish? Uh, they know, they only eat one and that's it. How many of y'all eat one fish? I can't eat one fish. I gotta eat what? Several fishes. I have to eat a whole school of fishes to be even remotely satisfied really? the way meat satisfies me. Yeah, because look how thin fish is. I mean, right? it's it doesn't like a fill me up. Of... Yeah, I like seafood. I can eat. I can eat lobster and just go and stuff. But crab. That's if you want, be careful, because crab has a lot of what? Fat. Yeah, sodium as well, and um, because it's what from the sea and also salt, right? And also, and then we we add add our spices and whatever, but. The best part of the crab, you guys like uh, eating like live crabs? Yeah. It's that, that yellow fatty stuff, isn't it? Oh, I can put that on bread and eat that all day, right? But is it good for you, no. right? What kind of fish is good for you? Poached, uh, steamed, and uh, um, uh, and um, and uh, even baked, right? But be careful broiling because medical has a thing about broiling because we found out about 15, 20 years ago uh, you know all the good broily bits, especially like in a steak. You know the gristle, mm -hmm. the fat, you know the black yeah. stuff, the char, which is, gives you what? Uh, apparently causes cancer. And same in fishes. You know when you have fish and you have a, a broiled Cajun uh, blackfish, right? That, that broiled, um, the crust on the end, apparently gives you cancer, right? So, you know, 
if you're into that, try not to eat that too much. <laughs> but, you know, what's one weekend? Okay. Right. Now, if you look at this plate, right, it is balanced. There is no one thing like uh, fruits, grains, vegetables, and proteins. Do you notice that that this RDA, this FDA thing, has all parts? So that, when you're considering a diet, you have to eat what? All parts. And me, I hate fruit. The only time I like fruit is if there's rum in it and there's an umbrella in the glass. But now that I don't drink no more, now I got to eat what? An actual strawberry instead of my lovely strawberry daiquiri. I have to actually eat real food. You can food. make it into a smoothie without anything added. But then, then I'm going, it's missing something. Imagine and then I realize it's missing Bacardi. And I'm like, nah, I don't like this. This is the worst bar in the world, right? But again, right, I have to. And that's actually what I do. I, I mash it up and then I like I mix it up with what little rice I have because me as Asian, I love rice. Rice and fruit? I can put most horrendous things in rice and then eat it all day. Really? Right? So I put a whole bunch of rice, my fruit that I don't like, and then I do a put in rice and plum, 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 and all I feel is the rice. And then I'm like, good to go. But do I eat a lot of the rice? No. No. Question. Um, do we need to, like, for as far as, do we need to know all the healthy habits of this plate thing? No, you just need to know, just need to know fruits, sure. grains, proteins, vegetables, Jesus. lipids, carbohydrate. So do I take anything of it? So if I give you a question where I'm taking a piece of this puzzle away, is that a legit diet medically? No. No, it is not. Now, uh, we're just going to go through this uh, real quick. Uh, just for your edification, because this is not a pathology class. Um, uh, um, you know, so you can know some things uh, clinically. So malnutrition, of course, you can either have undernutrition or our ever so popular overnutrition in this country. But guess what? We also have a lot in this country. I was talking to someone, uh, one of you, uh, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago is I no longer do medical missions abroad, overseas, because where are, where am I needed? I'm needed here. Uh, I've seen these things. I've seen under nutrition in so many cities. Uh, so now I'm doing, I, I strictly do only medical missions here. And I've been all over the Southeast Asian basin and seen malnutrition of all sorts. But I see these same things, Marasmus, Quashicor. I've seen this in Baltimore. I've seen it in DC. And what's Marasmus? Right. There's there's a whole bunch of kids, especially in uh, the lower socioeconomic places. They don't eat a lot of meat because meat is what? It's expensive. So what do they eat? They live on Pop-Tarts. I had a patient who lived on Pop-Tarts. Because what? Low income housing, single mom, mom doesn't have a great job. So this little man had to do what? eat Pop-Tarts because she worked like at the Dollar General and got those Pop-Tarts for free because they threw them out. So he had marasmus because he had no protein. Quashicor is uh, also another form of protein starvation, but you've probably seen Quashicor when you've seen, uh, you know, those stereotypical shows about, you know, uh, like uh, uh, parts of Africa that are starving or whatever. Well, guess what? There are also parts of Africa that are what? thriving, right? Uh, I have some friends in Zambia that uh, uh, their cities there make ours look like what? Uh, look like uh, country bumpkins. He was begging us, uh, he opened up a hospital there and he was begging us to stop by and, I'm like, and I saw his hospital, I was like, oh wow, this is really great. But just like in every major city, cities what? Also have what? Probably. Poverty, right? So if you've ever seen Quashicor, it's that little kid. You ever see those little children and their skin and bones? but their stomach is this big. And it's because they have protein starvation. It's making their liver work way too hard because then if it has no protein to metabolize, the liver is gonna do what? Just make fat because I need to make fat because I need energy. So the kid doesn't eat, the kid doesn't drink. So their belly gets really big. Mm -hmm. And then you'll we'll also see um, acrodactyly, the fingers get long. And then their nails get brittle to the point where you can just peel them off. And their skin, right? Their teeth. 
And I thought I only saw that in the so-called quote unquote third world. And then a couple of years ago, I was at a, uh, I was at a um, medical mission and uh, uh, for a local Baptist church in uh, Baltimore. I had three patients who had it. It was at the beginning stages, but I'm looking at these skinny, skinny kids with these three big bellies with, the, with dental caries and with the teeth falling out, eight, nine, ten years old. And then um, I went to uh, the Ozarks. I did a medical mission there. You know what the only thing they have in the Ozarks? They don't have any law. They don't have any education. They don't have any running water. You know what they got up there? Meth. That's it. There's whole meth factories up there. And there's small armies protecting it. Even the cops don't go up there. We got we got escorted up there by drug dealers for all intents and purposes because the church was there and then they were like, hey, let's help to help play out. I go, hey, didn't they teach you in school that you have to eat your four food groups? And the kids looking at me, school? What school? And also, if you guys ever been up there, they have their own language. It's English, but it isn't English. It's like if you guys ever went to, um, we had this guy, uh, a friend of ours in school, he had such a Cajun accent that we could never understand what he was saying, even though he understood Where and spoke English. Where is those arts? Uh, like yeah. And then it's in the middle of the mountains. It's very isolated and it's very low socioeconomic. Like, they don't even have farming. They used to have uh, mining populations and mining cities back then. But now, does anyone mine for anything? No. no. So now it's dead cities. These dead families who have nowhere else to go. And then, but guess what they learn how to make? Methamphetamine. And if you're in the mountains and nowhere, right? Only maybe three or four hours away from DC. Don't you think that would be a nice product? I mean, you can make yourself a nice chunk of, chunk of change. And they do. Anorexia nervosa. Nervosa means what? Nerves. So my patient is stressed out. Now I can tell you why they're starving themselves. Anorexia nervosa and bulimia are part of, of um, body dysmorphism syndrome. Now, this means what? Abnormal. Abnormal. Morph means shape. So all of us this morning, when we woke up and we looked in the mirror, right? We may not have looked optimal, but all of us in the morning did what? Looked in the mirror and went, okay, I look, I look pretty good for me. I don't look great, but I look good for what? On the scale of Nelson scale, I'm 10 on Nelson scale. On a normal human scale, I don't want to entertain that. So my ego is good and I walk out the door. But these people who vomit themselves, they have anorexia nervosa, they think what? I'm fat, I'm grotesque, right? So what do I have to do? I got to get thinner. But they're already what? Thin. And then they all do what? They eat. But when they eat, they starve themselves. Hence the words anorexia. And no, we're not orex um, oral or uh, to eat. So these people just simply won't eat. Oh, no matter what you do, you can time down. We put a line in them and we try to force feed them. Mm -hmm. They'll fight you. They'll fight you like you're trying to kill them. Now, bulimia <laughs> is kind of like an obsessive compulsive disorder. And if you look at the word OCD, you have an obsession, which is what your body dysmorphism. I'm looking at myself and I'm what? I'm garbage and I'm fat. I'm disgusting. Right? So what do I do? I feel I bad. Know. I have a compulsion to do what? Eat, 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 eat. Then you get depressed. Jesus, what's wrong with me? And then they do what? Vomit. And they repeat the cycle. And remember what I stated about vomiting. Is that healthy for you? No, you're kicking up a whole bunch of acid that's now going to mess up with your teeth. It's going to mess up all these other things. And what's it going to do? Your hormones? What's it going to do? Your health? So these two things are actually, yes, they're, they're, they're eating disorders, but actually they're body dysmorphism orders. And um, there's also a thing uh, that Muscle Magazine called about 20 years ago, manorexia. You ever, these, ever see these dudes in the gym? These guys, macho guys, right? They're constantly looking at themselves in the mirror and they got their little big jug full of whatever, well, uh, whatever juice they've made, thinking that it's gonna get them all what, swole? And then they talk that language. Yo, bro, you mean look at me, me bro. Yeah. Right? I've been in gym since I was 12 years old. Love these guys and hate these guys at the same time. But do you see some of them? They're there every day, even if they're sick. Right? They're constantly looking at themselves. Because why? Are they ever big enough? 
Are they ever strong enough? The guy could be like, right? And then what does he do? They take steroids. What do you think steroids do to your stuff down here? Decreases. Right? But what's going to happen? I got swole, son. Okay. He goes, can you use your penis? Don't need it, bro. I got biceps. But then that's what? It's body dysmorphism, isn't it? Why do you think, because why do you think when I was wrestling, I did everything in my power to make it to States? Why? why? Am I going to get some sort of trophy or medal if I have a jacket that's a state champion? I, I seriously made myself sick to lose the weight that I needed to lose for wrestling. Why would I do that? We worked out six hours a day, including Sundays. Why do you do that? We ran in the snow. Why? So I can have a jacket? Which, by the way, where do you think my jacket is now? And my pin. I lost my, my, my varsity pin. Where do you think my jacket is now? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know where it is. So I risked my life for four years as a child, right? That's what a teenager is. It's a child. For what? So I can be in the yearbook like this? This is my face. You know why this is my face? Because there was no Doritos in my life. And I was skinny. I looked awesome. Had the six pack. But look at my face. <laughs> Does this look like happiness to you? Then you look at me now. Hey. This is awesome because now I found what? Balance. I can have Doritos sometimes. I just Question. want to give you a two o'clock warning. Oh, two o'clock, two minute warning. And guess where I am? Yay! Life's not changed today. Dr. Christ is getting better at time management. That means the world is coming to an end and hell is now as air conditioned. So now, BMR. What happens? It rises a little bit. It peaks in adolescence. So what happens? You peaked in high school. That's what happened. And then what happens? Right? You get that what? That freshman uh, 15. What is freshman 15? Mm -hmm. No, that's that freshman 40. Yeah. Because why? Because what do you do in college? He goes, okay, drink, 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 drink. And of course, many of you, it's ladies night. It's two for one shot, $3 rumpies. What's a rumpy? I don't know. I still don't know. I got a... Uh, uh, I drank one. I still can't, can't identify what it is, but all I know is on Thursday night, it's only $5. Now, what happens? Aren't the things that are on this list are related to mood, related to how you feel? And that's why when you interview your patient, you don't ask how much weight did you lose? You don't ask what's your goal weight, how many miles you did. What do you really ask? You really ask, how are you feeling? Then you do what? Then you look at your labs. Because what's going to start seeing? You're going to start seeing a deficiency of vitamins. That's why you 20-somethings in here, should you be taking any vitamins? No, just eat right. But those of us, because once you get older, what should you do? Modify your diet and then take what? You don't have to take Centrum, right? Modify your diet and then whatever's missing off your labs, that's the thing you do. Calcium deficiency, we always talked about that, ladies. Why? Why do all women have babies. calcium deficiency? Babies. Because they can have babies. After you get pregnant, what is your physiology now geared for? Baby or you? Baby. You. Oh. I mean, oh, oh that's yeah. a factor. That shows to show that I am hypoglycemic, right? Calcium is now for what? Baby. Even though baby's what? 20 years old and asking for money and the car keys, right? <laughs> And last but not least, vitamin de deficiency, right? We are all in very, don't be surprised when you're working as a nurse that you never get to see daylight. For a whole year out of my life in first year residency, I'm in before the sun comes up and I'm out way after the sun goes down. So you think I probably developed a vitamin D deficiency? Mm -hmm. You betcha. And I told you guys, during the pandemic, my kids all had vitamin D and calcium deficiencies. And they're, you know my, my kids, I torture them. I give them things to do and eat. You know I watch after them because that's the kind of parent that I am, right? But you can see that they had deficiencies because of what? A certain lifestyle. And isn't that, you know, when they kept them talking about the new normal? That's what, the new abnormal. That's what I like to call it. Your question and then so yours. For, the, do you, for like uh, test lines, do you want us to know the, the starvation? There's four, no, four because remember, I don't need no pathologies. I wanted them for your edification so that when you're out in the field, you see something like Quashicor, um, uh, bulimia, 
anorexia nervosa, if you know what they're talking about. Okay, Question. so uh, that's what I was going to say. No malnutrition. No, no, no pathologies. Okay. Only normal, normal. Okay. What I need to put in my body. Not what the horrible things that we as human beings do. And body dysmorphism, don't you think that also relates to why some of these people, you know, you, uh, remember we see those people who um, uh, have like multiple... Uh,